I am. I have the pleasure of being joined by Jonathan Kay. He is a Canadian journalist and the senior editor at Quillette. How you do, John? Good. How are you? Thanks for being on the show. I'm doing all right. So, John, I would like to begin by asking you about your journalistic background. I mean, I'm a big fan of Quillette, and I wonder, uh, one of us. <clears throat> Are you one of the founding members of the site? No. So Quillette is, is pretty small operation by the standards of, of these kind of sites. The founder is a woman named Claire Lehman. Uh-huh. Uh, she's based in Sydney, Australia. And then the guy who was with her from the beginning is uh, my colleague, uh, Jamie Palmer, who's based in, in London, England. And I think for maybe... A, two years, I want to say they were, it was just the two of them. Uh, and then, and then I joined along with a guy by the name of Toby Young, who's also in England. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then other people have, have helped out. There's a guy, um, Colin Wright, who's based in the United States. He was with us. Uh, he, he is with us. Uh, he's managing editor. Um, some of your, your listeners may know him. He's got a huge following. Uh, on social media. He's an evolutionary biologist. Uh, yes, it's pretty small shop. And yeah, like I said, for the first couple of years, it was really just two people. Mm-hmm. Oh, so what is what did you do before joining Quillette? I know that uh, your your mother, Barbara Kay, is a well-known journalist in Canada. And i um, not sure if I, when did you decide to say follow her footsteps, so to speak? Well, I got to, I got to correct you there. Um, <laughs> All right. I, cause I look, my mom's a very smart, good writer, always been a good writer and has done a, a lot of stuff. She's been an educator and she's written for newspapers uh, off and on in her earlier part of her life. But in terms of getting regular journalistic work, I joined the national post newspaper in Canada in 1998, which mm-hmm. uh, seems like the blink of an eye, but it's been 24 years. Uh, and then I think it was 2002, maybe four years later, that she started becoming a regular columnist for the National Post. I was still like I was working as a copy editor, editorial board member, and uh, and she hasn't looked back. So that was 20 years ago. She's been writing a weekly newspaper columns for 20 years, which is, is a long time mm-hmm. uh, in, this fee- in this field. Um, but yeah, in terms of the profession, I got in slightly before her, although... Um, her name recognition, I think, skyrocketed ahead of me. She was just a very good columnist. She just has a good natural columnist voice. Whereas I think I've sort of bounced around in terms of my role. I've edited a magazine here. In, there's a Canadian magazine called The Walrus that I was involved with. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, you know, I've done re- like reporting. I've also done opinion columns. Uh, I was the opinion editor at the National Post. And, and now I guess Quillette, I divide my time between editing and writing, mostly editing and podcasting. Like, you know, mm-hmm. five years ago, five years ago, if you told me I was going to spend a big amount of my time on podcasting, <laughs> I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought so. But, uh, you know, one lesson I've learned about journalism in the current environment is you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You have to hustle. You have to be doing different things. So that could mean podcasting, writing, editing, uh, maybe for some people doing corporate work, doing ghostwriting, uh, writing books under your own name, uh, being active on social media to a certain extent, though you shouldn't let it take over your life. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you, like you have to hustle, <laughs> is what I'd say. Of course, yeah. yeah. So how would you describe uh, Quillette for those who are not in the loop of it? I know that you know, when I wrote you that email, um, I said that is a beacon of free thought, and I meant it because uh, uh, when I was in university in Canada, I, I think it was my, in my second year where I was worried about the stifling of free thought in the, the college campus I was in. Uh, one of my um, English professors who was actually a, a free thinker, he, he recommended that I check out the site. I, I had heard of the site before, but yeah, that's when I actually uh, dive into it. So, well, yeah. thank you for reading and, and thank you to the professor for suggesting it. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes if you're a reader of Quillette or, or some other publications, uh, I think sometimes there's like a certain stereotypical image of academia that emerges as like very monolithically progressive and mm-hmm. maybe not um, 
pluralistic in terms of the viewpoints that are incurred, but I, it's, it's, it's nice to hear counterexamples and it's important that I hear counterexamples because yeah, it is easy to fall into stereotypes. Quillette's politics, um, I, I would say it's often in politics these days, people are defined by their haters. And so to a certain extent in Canada, I'm, there are some who consider me a conservative mostly because there are hyper progressive people who don't like what I have to say. And there are also people who consider me progressive or liberal or, you know, they use root, rooter words in that um, because there are some hardcore conservatives who, who don't like what I have to say, especially about things like vaccines, right? I, I've been, I'm very pro, pro-vax and I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of hardcore conservatives who, uh, uh, who that's become their issue. And so, yeah, we live in this era when people are defined according to their heresies. So, you know, J.K. Rowling is denounced as this like transphobe. Know, yeah, yeah, because you know she has opinions on gender that probably accord with like eighty or ninety percent of people. But mm-hmm. from a, a certain point of view, she's a heretic. And by the by the same lights, by analogy, um, you know, you could be a rock ribbed conservative down the line, but if you support say vaccine mandates. Uh, there will be people who, who denounce you. Yeah, again, it's sort of like religious movements where you're defined according to your heresies. The example I give is like, if you, <laughs> if I go to, I'll take a really extreme example. If I go to ISIS, let's say I go to, I try and join ISIS, the, the terrorist organization. Hope that won't happen. It's not going to happen, <laughs> but, or, or let's say, you know, whatever ISIS is like equivalent is in, in other religions or like, you know, some, but anyway, let's stick with ISIS. Sure. Um, and I show up and I say, hey, dudes, I'm like, I think I'm going to be a solid recruit for you. I converted to Islam. I pray five times a day. Um, you know, I give zakat. I've done the Hajj. And I just go down the list. It's like, I hate America. I hate Israel. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're like, okay, cool. Like, this is like, you, you're ticking all our boxes. But then at the end of the discussion, I say to them, but like, there's one thing you should know about me is like, I'm super gay. Like I, you know, I'm just like, like, I'm so attracted to guys, you know, and they're not going to say to me, okay, well, look, you're 99 out of a hundred and that's pretty good. So you're an ISIS. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to say, I'm sorry, you don't meet it. Like, it's just not going to work out. And I'm going to be like, why? And it's like, well, cause you know, you failed one of our tests. And that is how a lot of religious movements work. It's how a lot of cults work. It's how a lot of strong political ideologies work. You know, take Marxism. Um, or, or fascism, but it works either way. If like, if, if let's say it was the 1930s and you and I, we were like in a Marxist movement uh, and we were talking about like uh, Marxist Leninism. And I was like, yeah, you know, I totally believe that history is dictated by, um, you know, the modes of economic production, but you know, I've never really, I've never really been into the proletariat. I think it's going to be the, the, the rural peasants who drive history. Mm -hmm. But like, I believe all the other stuff. Like Marxists would be, well, no, you, know, you can't be a Marxist. He's, that's, that's bullshit. Like this, and I'd be like, but I believe all the other stuff. And the reason I recite all this is because I think normal politics doesn't work like that. Like it used to be not so long ago, like 10 years ago, you could say, I'm generally conservative, but you know, I'm really pro-choice or I'm generally progressive or liberal as the word was, but you know, I, I really believe in low taxes or you could dissent and still call yourself a member of the movement. Mm -hmm. What has happened is politics has become more and more cultish and more and more like a religious movement where everything is defined according to heresies. And you see this, especially on gender and race stuff. So I think this is a long-winded way of saying Quillette is a place for people who reject all that stuff, who who, who maybe have a more old fashioned view of politics, which is we don't judge you according to your heresies. at Quillette, I will publish a person who has doctrinaire views on gender mm-hmm. um, or extremely progressive views on gender if they make their case in a way that's logical uh, and, 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 and they don't use a kind of ideologically incestuous jargon that is only going to be comprehensible to people who believe what they have to say. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's how I would define Quillette. And I know maybe you were expecting like, oh, we're 60% liberal, 40% conservative, or like the sort of one dimensional spectrum people use, but I would say it's more 
I don't want to use the word, but it's more meta than that. It's people who want to opt out from that. People who find politics these days really cultish and are looking for another framework. Um, and that framework, to my mind, means like more science oriented, uh, more debate oriented, uh, a rejection of jargon in the way we we argue things. Um, I tell people like, make sure I don't care if I disagree with you, but make sure you're making your argument in a way using neutral language that people on the other side will understand, which is not, you know, it's often people don't do it when they're ideologically uh, monomaniacs. Um, yeah, and, and as a result, we tend to get people in flux, people mm -hmm. who are like former conservatives who are, you know, disenchanted with Trumpism and they're becoming progressives, or they're often, maybe more commonly, people who are like formerly really doctrinaire progressives and who become disenchanted with that scene and are in flux. And, and they, uh, so, you know, I have a lot of gay writers. I have a lot of like um, artists and academics who just like become disenchanted with that. What happens though, is we don't, there's a lot of writers, we don't keep them in our orbit for more than a year or two because, because they're in flux, they may end up going to like another wing of the political spectrum. And, you know, before I know it, they're writing for maybe more politically charged outlets. So it's, it's been interesting because I've been there, let's see, how long? Five years almost. Yeah. And so I've seen, I, I've seen the trajectories of these people. Like someone comes in, I'm like, oh my God, this is such a perfect Quillette writer. I love what they're saying. You know, and they, for a year or two, they're writing for me. But then I see it's like, there's this natural drift because tribalism has a pull on people, right? Yeah. It's not normal to be in a kind of flux state, which is what Quillette is. Um, it's normal to kind of attach yourself to one tribe or another. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one of the frustrations of being a Quillette editor is you're losing writers because they go to one tribe or another. On the other hand, as soon as they get knocked loose from these tribes, you get them back, right? <laughs> They're, you get it. So it's, it's been fun. It's interesting. Oh, yeah. And, um, and the way I see it, I mean, I think um, many people these days are drawn away from politics because of its uh, tribal nature. But I think... Yeah. Um, if politics are more ideas focused, then uh, we could be we have a more engaged uh, police or a uh, populace. Yeah, um, I think it's always useful for me to talk to people who are outside the space of like academia or ac activism or journalism, mm -hmm. because the stuff they're interested in is people often like drill really deep, right? So. You know, you'll get people who are interested in soccer or something like my my gym trainer is just like totally into soccer. And, and if you look at his phone and you look at his like social media feeds on Twitter or Facebook, yeah, he doesn't use Twitter, but say Facebook. It's like everything he follows is like soccer, like soccer groups or just scores or and I remember like I'll talk to him even about so even about politics. I remember I said, hey, so, you know, who do you like in the, the upcoming provincial election? And he said to me, well, who's running? And this is like a week before the election. <laughs> um, now, on one hand, it's like, that's bad because he's not politically engaged. But on the other hand, it's also, I'm not sure if that's better or worse than, than people who are just 24 seven obsessed with politics and are making decisions about like their friend groups mm -hmm. on the basis. You know, my family, we had like, a, it wasn't my immediate family, it was, second cousin type stuff um you know elections it gets stressful because you got people with really strong political not me I, I don't actually talk politics with with family it's i just don't do it but it's become like their religion right mm -hmm. um because the, these aren't religious people but the substitute for religion is this politics stuff and it because you know people end up not talking to each other um it's really it's really rough so i think it, in that context, the guy who doesn't use Twitter for politics and is just looking at soccer scores, I, maybe that's an improvement. Yeah. Maybe I'd, I, pr I prefer people who aren't at all vested in politics than people who are vested so much that it takes over every aspect of their life. Oh, yeah. They make for better Thanksgiving dinner guests, obviously. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, I wish to drill into the academia question a bit, but I wish it have some of your quick takes on certain events happening right now. So the first question being, what's the nicest thing you can say about Justin Pierre Trudeau? Well, Justin Trudeau, 
I would say is a naturally charismatic mm-hmm. and considerate and empathetic person who has endured the perhaps inevitable corruption of politics. And it's been really interesting because I got to spend some time with him when I was working on a book project. And I I thought he was was a great guy. He's like really nice. And I thought I I really liked his his vision of Canada. I think he was a real patriot. Mm -hmm. And then as the years pass, you know, he's surrounded by all these people who all they want to do is like score points against the opposition and win the next election. And meanwhile, the opposition is hammering him like, you know, he puts a foot out of place and they're saying, you know, they're putting up press releases about how he's, he's not fit to be prime minister. And then the years pass and these people become like really unhappy and sour and negative. And, and Trudeau just has this naturally upbeat disposition. Like he really was a, a super happy guy. Mm-hmm. And I think that's his natural state, right? I think at when politics is done, I think he'll return to that state. Um, so yeah, I will say about him that he, he his natural inclination is he's, he's a very healthy, well socialized, considerate, mm-hmm. uh, and smart. He's a smart guy, human. Uh, unfortunately, um, he's been infected by politics. And and you know, I, I knew I knew Stephen Harper a little bit before. Well, Stephen Harper is a different case because he's already kind of like a sourpuss. But um, <laughs> politics just poisons people. It turns like you know, it's it's institutionalized tribalism, like politics. When we talk about the world of ideas, like Quillette and stuff, there's at least a conceit that it's not tribalistic. Whereas in politics, you don't even have that conceit. Like it is tribalistic. Like political parties are officially organized political tribes. Yeah. So, I mean, you couldn't pay me enough to get in that environment. Yeah. Um, I think his, um, his uh, reaction to the, um, the truckers convoy that's going on yeah. is quite appalling. And uh, so, uh, how do you make up the coverage, uh, the Canadian, say, so, mainstream can, coverage? Do you, mind, do you mind if I say something about his reaction to the trucker thing? Please do. Because based on, on the time I spent with him, I don't know of any other politician who would have been better suited to address the trucker thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a guy who has the common touch. You know, I've seen him in campaign mode, like in... Uh, you know, the greasy spoon poutine restaurants in Quebec. And he just, you know, if, if he wanted to, as, as much as all those truckers said they hated Trudeau, if he wanted to, he could have marched down, started shaking hands with these truckers and he would have charmed them because he is, he's a charming guy. And, and as much as they had all this rhetoric, like we hate Trudeau, shit, you know, we're, we're face to face with the most powerful guy in Canada. That's cool. Right. And I think in the space of like a couple of hours, he could have, you know, he climbed into one of their cabs and, 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 and he would have said, you know, as I disagree with you on this, I disagree, but he would have talked to them and they would have been able to leave the city in dignity, right? Mm-hmm. Because no one wants to leave without at least someone acknowledging your presence, right? And um, I've, I saw him do it in action. Like when I was in, in Papineau riding, you know, he, separatists, Quebec separatists, people who really did want to break up the country, right? Mm-hmm. He, he would he would talk to them respectfully he said i i don't agree with you i love canada i don't want to break this country up uh he always had like a positive constructive attitude toward that he could have done that in this case unfortunately this trucker thing came out like what how many years eight years into his tenure and by now he's been like infected with politics so for him the original reflex, at least, was just this is another way to smear the conservatives as like Nazis or whatever. So mm-hmm. it, it just he didn't have that reflex, which is too bad because his 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 the skills that he brought into politics would have actually really worked well to defuse this crisis. I think um, Justin, um, uh, in my years of being in Canada and witnessing him sort of like trailing on. Um, uh, he exhibits a tendency that I find, uh, I mean, unlikable about like m- most Canadians, especially Canadians in who are college educated. I hope you do not take offense to this. Is that uh-huh. they always pretend to be more progressive than they actually are, and this brings us to another Canadian, and this is a music show. We have to mention Neil Young and Joni Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I've been a fan of the Joe Rogan experience, the podcast. It's not my favorite podcast, but it is, uh, but it introduced me to some of my favorite podcasts. And um, for Neil Young and Joni Mitchell and co to basically trying to censor this man who, you know, who does not poses a danger to society at all and is actually it he does exhibit the Colette ethos of uh, free speech no political tribes free thought and I it does strike me as uh, disappointing because I, I actually like these musicians you know? yeah um so here <laughs> I want to read you a, uh, a tweet oh um you. so do you know who Olivia Chow is uh no please do tell so uh, olivia chow is uh, a well-known uh, left of center uh political figure uh, i don't she's not in politics anymore she's the former a former member of parliament former city councilor um anyway she um she was married to to uh, former ndp leader um so she she's tweeting about joe rogan and she tweets out an excellent analysis of Rogan's racism. She's tweeting out a Daily Show clip. <laughs> and she says, she says, that's why I have Apple Music, not Spotify. <laughs> so this is how you demonstrate your left-wing bona fides mm -hmm. in, in this world we have. Not by like giving money to the poor, not by, you know, all of the, the conventional ways you would make someone else's life better, like taking care of people. Um, and I, I say this as somebody, it's not like I spend every day of the week doing volunteer work or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it used to be like, you know, to be a socialist, to be a left winger, it, it really meant like helping working people, you know, higher tax rates, all that stuff. And to give Olivia Chow credit, I'm sure she believes in all that stuff. But if you look at what people like Olivia Chow increasingly talk about, it's basically a status seeking game conducted among wealthy urbanites where it's about the right hashtags it's about like in this case having apple music on your phone instead of spotify like seriously who the fuck cares right <laughs> and it's I, by the way like apple this is a company that <laughs> doesn't it like operate um some fairly sketchy labor practices in china like it's it's not like when i think apple it's like oh you know it's this company run by mother Teresa, like like all big companies, it has, it has huge ethical issues associated with a supply chain. Yeah. Um, and the idea that you're, you know, it's like kind of reminds me of that. I know these people who are like, I care about the environment. I drive 50 kilometers to get organic shampoo. Like <laughs> they just, because the organic shampoo you can see, right? Like it's sitting there, maybe they'll put it on their Instagram thing. Whereas the fact that you burn half a tank of gas in your Q8, getting to the stupid store where they sell this crap, people like that's not as visible so mm -hmm. it's all become about status seeking and uh what hashtags you use like you know how big is your black lives matter black square and your instagram um you know how many times a day do you do land acknowledgements and pronoun checks and all this stuff this look by the way this is complete exaggeration and satire most progressives do not live their life this way however i actually have been in, in the company of people who i generally like and respect respect and a lot of their conversations about bullshit like this <laughs> and 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 sometimes you know i have this reputation i don't I'm, as i said i don't not particularly conservative but sometimes i'm really nostalgic for progressives who actually care about marxism and socialism and and care about like you know just redistributing wealth and stuff which you could say it retards growth to a certain extent like when taxes are too high obviously the economy suffers but at least the idea of redistributing wealth does does help people who are disadvantaged. You know, uh, public health care, proper mental health care, a good safety net. You know, here in Canada, a lot of people don't have proper dental care. Mm -hmm. I'd pay higher taxes for that kind of stuff. What I'm not going to pay higher taxes for is like a nationally funded broadcaster that spends half its time like pissing down on Joe Rogan and stuff. And but I don't even like Joe Rogan. I've never heard Joe Rogan's podcast. Okay. I, I tell people, I say, the only podcasts I listen to are like nerdball historical podcasts about stuff that happened a thousand years ago. <laughs> and, but when I, when I read Olivia Chow tweet about, that's why I have Apple music, not Spotify. It makes me want to go to the wall for Rogan. 
Yeah. Like, even though Rogan, from what I understand, he he says a lot of like misinformation about vaccines, and that's bad. I don't I don't approve of that. Um, so you know, I probably Olivia Chow and I, if we were talking, we would probably have very similar views on the actual content of Rogan's uh, podcast. Where where I would differ with some of her like her is whether it's actually productive to respond to that opposition to the content by trying to get them canceled by like making yourself look virtuous as somebody who's just like you know publicly posturing against them or whether just in your personal life or you know as a public figure you promote the science of vaccines you don't hector people you don't try and like tear people down because you disagree with them uh because that's sanctimonious it turns people off like again i'm vaccinated but the only thing that makes me not want to be vaccinated is listening to these progressive hypocrites who, you know, you go and look at their social media feeds and they'll be like, they'll have three masks on and like their name, they'll change their name, like Joe Triple Vax Smith and stuff. And I feel like, like this isn't your identity. A vaccine is a tool to make you healthy, right? It's a tool to protect you and your family members. But if, if, if being vaccinated is like defines who you are, it's like a medal you wear around your neck, then you're a prick. Like the only people who are gonna like you are people who have the same medal around their neck and, and feel that way about how they should gain status in society. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I'm conflict on this because I, I, you know, sometimes I go on right-wing podcasts. They're like, don't you hate vaccines? And I said, no, I don't hate vac vaccines. You want to get rid of the lockdown? You want you want the government to stop telling you what to do? Then get vaccinated. The yeah, sooner that happens, definitely. the sooner the pandemic ends, and they can you can get the government out of your face, which is what you tell me you want. But you know, if you don't get vaccinated, you get sick. I mean, that just prolongs the pandemic, gives the government more excuse to tell you what to do, and frankly, you get what you deserve. Um, so, so I, I do take, tell people to get vaccinated, but I, I never suggest to them that they're they're bad people because they're not vaccinated i never suggest them i'm a good person because i am vaccinated it's the yeah. worst thing you can do in this discussion yeah i agree i i've always um uh ever since covid started i've always looked forward to when they uh, uh devised a vac a vaccine for it which uh you know when they did as soon as they did i i got it um uh, because uh it would help with the lockdown but then again the the lockdowns never end and even I'm in here, I'm in Hanoi, Vietnam now, and, um, you know, we still have to wear masks when we are outside and people are getting a fourth and fifth uh, vaccine doses. Um, so, uh, I mean, what I, when, when COVID first uh, started, I, I was worried, I mean, the, the disease itself, the, the virus itself was pretty concerning, but I was worried about the way that people would react to it. I think two years ago in one of my classes, I one of the assigned texts was uh, Daniel Defoe's uh, journey of a journal of plague year. So oh yeah okay yeah that so as I read it, I I saw that you know the book was written like maybe a hundred or so years after the actual event, but it 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 struck uh, it was true in that the the people who were reacting to the 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 plague they were worse than the plague itself and it was is true now in the era of COVID-19 and my question to you is do you is there a foreseeable end to COVID? Um, so I think you know I'm not a virologist but what seems to be happening with Omicron Omicron is a very severe form of flu right mm -hmm. um, if you are vaccinated and boosted so you know, I'm, I'm a 53 year old uh, male without any comorbidities who's uh, double vaxxed and boosted. The chance of me dying or even going to the ICU because of Omicron, it's never zero, but it's extremely low. Um, you know, ordinary seasonal flu kills about 3,500 Canadians a year. That's about 10 a day, but in the flu season, it's more, it's concentrated. It's just like maybe 20, 30, 40 a day. That's kind of what Omicron looks like. It's kind of uh, asymptoting to become. Uh, I, so if, if Omicron is the last major wave and who knows if it's gonna be that last major wave, 
and people do maintain uh, boosting regimens, COVID is, is going to become something like the seasonal flu, mm -hmm. uh, something that can kill you, something that if you have it, you should stay home. Um, but it's not going to be like the Black Plague. You know, it's interesting, you know, you were talking about reading this book and mm -hmm. I listened to historical podcasts. Um, I, there was a play in Roman, in the Roman era, there was something called the Antonine Plague, which I think it was the second century AD. And I think historians disagree about how much it contributed to um, some of the epic changes that took place in the Roman Empire. But, you know, millions and millions of people died. It was hugely disruptive. You know, whole, whole legions would, would drop dead in the field and stuff like that. It was, it was really bad. And I, I love listening to these historical accounts of what happened in ancient times. And you don't even have to go back to the Romans, I mean, you could go back to like 18th century or, um, you know, we didn't have vaccines. I think smallpox vaccine was the first one we had, but, uh, and thinking like, what if I could time travel back there, right? And I could say to these people, there's this thing I can inject in your arm and it'll give you like 90% protect, protection from this horrible disease that otherwise would kill your whole family. Mm -hmm. they, they'd think, I was like a god or some kind of amazing magician. And I, at least I like to think they'd line up to take it. I don't know, maybe, they'd, maybe there'd be, I'd give birth to the time traveling anti-vax movement. I have no idea. But, <laughs> but, but think about if those people who like were watching like their, their kids die in their arms, like if you say, I'm gonna give, and I'm gonna give it to you for free. Like <laughs> I've been vaxxed and boosted. I haven't paid a cent for it. And, it, and they'd be like, you were, you'd be like an angel from heaven, but now we are so suspicious of science and we, we take our own um, health for granted so much. You know, we just, a lot of us just walk around assuming we're gonna live 80, 90 years, right? Um, which, which would be an eternity for, for people, anybody who lived before, you know, maybe the, the modern era. Um, and then we don't, we reject this free, med, free medication. Uh, which again, in any other era of human history, like just, they would regard as magic, mm -hmm. just like this thing you put in your body and that it saves you from the thing that's killing all the other villagers. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so it, yeah, it pains me that people aren't taking this stuff and it's stupid. And well, I don't I see, I don't like to use words that like stupid. It's not helpful, but if anyone's listening to this podcast and they're not vaccinated, like, I don't know if you know my shtick and social media or the way I write, like, I don't think I'm a person who just is known to sort of drink the Kool-Aid and mm -hmm. just like goes along with whatever the government tells me, you know, liberal government here in Canada is telling me that men are women, women are men, and you know, <laughs> biological sex doesn't exist. And I'm like, no, that's fucked up. I disagree with that. Oh, yeah. So I, I disagree with the government when it tells me nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I disagree that Canada is a genocide state, which is another piece of garbage that we've been it is. told that, that, you know, I mean, by the Canada's done some horrible things to indigenous peoples, but the idea that Canada in 2022 is a genocide state, no. And, and if you tell me that, I'm going to tell you it's BS. So I recite all this just because I'm not someone who just drinks any glass of Kool-Aid you put in front of me. Uh -huh. And the reason I drink the, the vaccine Kool-Aid is because you've got tens of millions of people who've gone through what is essentially the largest clinical study uh, and the most scrupulously analyzed and monitored medication regimen worldwide uh, that has been known to modern medical science. And, and we know vaccines are safe and they save lives. And I, again, I don't think the government should make you take vaccines, but if you're listening to me and you kind of respect my point of view, you haven't been vaccinated, I urge you to get vaccinated. It can help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've already got it. Uh, to <laughs> doses and uh, you're a good person. You're a good person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I know that my family gets it. And, um, the rest of my families get it. I'm, I'm my mother works in a hospital, so she's like uh, getting everyone through the, I guess, the, well, the well, procedure. One of, one of my tennis partners is an emergency room doctor. Mm -hmm. I was asking him about Omicron, and I mean he's right in the thick of it, right? You know, ER sees people come in gasping for breath on stuff. Oh, yeah. And he said he's lost two patients. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, which two patients? He said the first was a 79 year old unvaxxed woman. I think it was a woman. And she said she never got vaccinated because she didn't have time and she died. And that's, that's, that's tragic, right? Like she wasn't an anti-vaxxer. She just, she said she didn't have time. 
The other one, maybe even sadder, this guy was 90 years old, which is weird. The Ontario statistics suggest that almost 100% of, of people over 90 have been vaccinated. But this guy came in and the whole family came in. None of them were vaccinated. And it was just a sad, pathetic situation because even when the doctors gave the diagnosis, they're like, they didn't believe it was COVID. They thought COVID was nonsense. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really bad because um, these are just preventable deaths. Like it's, it's like not wearing a seatbelt and being killed in like a 20 kilometer an hour car crash or something. It's the equivalent of that. Um, so you hate to see that. And, and I do talk about, it. you know, some of those conservative social media, whatever, they like, they lash out. It's like, don't tell us what to do. Or, you know, don't manipulate us with your sob stories. It's like, how is it a sob story if, you know, these lives have been snuffed out for no reason? And they say, well, I'm not at risk. I'm 40. It's like, really? Okay. How old's your mom? How old's her mom? Uh, you know, you want to you wanna spend the next couple of years just like never seeing them? And because old people die of other causes, like don't you want to spend time with them? So um, as you can see, just from my tone of voice, it's easy to see how this gets into hectoring and moralizing, which I try and avoid. But, um, you know, you don't want to see people waste away for no reason. Of course. I want to pivot to uh, what's going on in academia at the moment. So it starts with... Uh, Jordan Peterson's uh, decision to leave the University of Toronto, which uh, I think if you've followed him for quite a while, as uh, I've I have, I mean, yeah. I kind of saw this decision coming, and he he has expressed his frustration with the academic system for quite a while. But um, what I seem to what I worry about is that it, with these like exodus of uh, professors from university, professors that are heterodox and uh, you know actually invested in their academic work, we will, we will probably see a rise in, say, the, the, the academics who, I think uh, I've talked to uh, Lindsay Shepard uh, a year ago yeah. about, her, about her book, and I, I worry that the universities will be wholly, if not virtually, 99% populated by the same professors who gave uh, Ms. Shepard a bad time. Yeah, Nathan Rumbacana or whatever his name is. Yeah. What was his name? Sorry, I, I want to... Nathan Laurier Lindsay. Yeah, I think it's uh, Rambucana. That, that's uh, the last Nathan name. Nathan Rambucana. Yeah, that guy was a piece of work. And obviously, my the professor who actually directed me to Colette, he's retiring very soon. And the the people who are like his counterparts, his yeah, fellow English professors, but younger, they they basically bought into the post-colonial narrative, the uh, the ideas that the idea that basically Western civilization is but a dog whistle for subjugation and the white European supremacy and all that nonsense. So I gotta go soon, but I want to read you something. Oh yeah, um, because so academia is one thing. Like mm-hmm. if you go into academia. I think academia has always been into kind of like not as bad as it is now, but you know, it's sort of um, even in the eighties, you know, David Lodge, this British writer was writing these satires of faculty lounge um, internal politics, Mm -hmm. which wasn't as much maybe about ideology then as it was one of the other romances and other stuff, but academia, I think has always had very toxic subcultures, Mm. but, but, it's one thing that's in academia. It's another thing that's in everyday life. So somebody sent me, this is from Facebook. It was Vancouver, which is like Canada's wokest city, right? And it was this guy named Ocean. And Ocean is looking for a roommate. And can I read you Ocean's uh, ad on Facebook looking for a roommate? All right, let's hear it. Hello, loves. I am Ocean. And I moved to, and there's like, he means Vancouver, but it's just like a whole bunch of alphanumeric letters and numbers corresponding to indigenous names of places, which I can't pronounce properly, but it's like picture like 50 letter word salad, which basically means Vancouver, but it's mm-hmm. indigenous uh, transliteration. Yeah. I moved here just a month ago and looking for an intentional communal place to rest and replenish with a bunch of authentic folks. One of the reasons I exist because of my neighbors, aunties, and both my grandmas raised me in a community. 
and therefore the passion and devotion of creating a nurturing and safe, inclusive communal root space is what I strive for. My ideal dream is to live sustainably and communal, communally on the land with my loved ones under indigenous guidance and direction. Mm -hmm. However, however, at this moment of my life, I am in the epicenter of colonialism and capitalism. So the tiny bit of life and freedom left amongst the concrete is having a root space that's filled with sincerity, consciousness, trauma-informed communication, love, kindness, and humility. My primary ways of showing love and affection are through making big meals for people. I am all the colonial terms, they, am, non-binary, queer, trans, polyamorous, immigrant, mm -hmm. trying to kick the white supremacy out of its existence doing my internal decolonial shadow work as I have been drowning in the white water my entire life. I am a loyal, honest human, an outreach worker at DTES, that's uh, downtown east side, visual storyteller, artist, farmer in progress, community activist. I am consumed with food sovereignty and decolonization during my free time. Thank you for your time and energy, loves. Wishing healthy mind and body for your being. This is an ad for a roommate. Yeah. Right. And he had to write like this is one, two, three, four, five, six. It's eight paragraphs. <laughs> it, it basically says like pretentious 20 something dude seeks roommate. And then he adds in this is, this is what I like here. It says, he says, I'm not a hyper clean person, but don't do well in clutter. <laughs> love to wake up or come back to an organized living room and kitchen. So like he just told us how like he hates all this like colonialism and like, you know, he's all into the earthiness. And then kind of at the end, he just sort of adds in like no slobs. <laughs> like, it just, it's, it's just so funny. Um, and, but this isn't academia. Like if so I get, I get sent stuff like this all the time because people know I like to tweet crap like this and they, mm -hmm. Often it's from some syllabus or some course like called whatever decolonizing uh, Hispanic film or, you know, and the guy's like, look how woke this is like, well, what do you expect? You, you joined some stupid woke class and now you're <laughs> surprised that like this garbage is, is, is you make, they're making you learn this crap. And I'm like, you know, next time take mechanical engineering and maybe most of the class won't consist of stuff like this. But but this is like people scrolling through Facebook. They're basically, you know, if you're a woman, you're trying to find a guy maybe or a woman who will pay the rent on time and not hit on you. Like that's kind of what you're looking for. <laughs> and instead you have to read the sanctimonious gibberish from some guy who's trying to save the planet with his Facebook ad. This to me is worse than the academic stuff because it's like it interferes with everyday life. <laughs> so this is, the, these are the people we we need to cancel them. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> anyway, I gotta go. I gotta pick up my daughter from volleyball. That's uh, okay. So yeah, uh, I do have a lot more to uh, discuss. You know what? You Bring about, me but... on if you have time. Get me on of in course. a couple of months, and we'll of do course. it again. But what whatever questions you have, if if people are interested, I'm, I'm happy to do this again in a month or two. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for your time, John, and keep okay. up doing the good work. All right. Talk soon. <laughs>